All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our first ever live Q&A on Facebook. It's a very exciting day for us here at Light. Uh, my name is Bradley Lautenbach, and I lead the marketing and design teams uh, here at the company. And I'm joined today by two really special guests, uh, Prashant Velagaletti, who leads our engineering and product management teams, and the man, the myth, the legend, Dr. Rajiv Laroya, who is our CTO and co-founder, um, and whose uh, brainchild this company and, and product are. Um, it was actually Rajiv's frustration as a photographer almost seven years ago that led him to go on the hunt for the solution to the photographer's dilemma. And what do we mean by that? Um, it's the question we've all faced before. Of, do I take the good camera with me today? Do I bring the bag of gear with me? Or do I kind of suffer through what I get out of my phone and the constraints that that camera comes with? And ultimately out of that was born the L16. So last year was a really milestone year for us uh, here at Light. We shipped the first L16s to photographers. We saw incredible results coming in from the field, and we began our concerted effort to bring uh, regular software updates to the camera over the air. And by the end of the year, we'd stabilized production as well. So at the factory, things were humming along, um, and it was very exciting. This is no small feat because this is a very complicated device to put together and a supply chain that spans the globe. So now we're on to 2018. Uh, the year ahead is going to be really exciting because we're going to bring a lot of interesting changes to the camera, um, improvements, um, new features, uh, an up upgrade to the image quality. Um, and that's really exciting. So we're here to talk about that primarily today. Um, and what I hope is the first in a series of Q&As we'll do as a company. Um, we know this has been a request of yours for some time. And we're excited to, to kind of connect in this forum for the first time today. Um, so this morning on the blog, uh, we published our first public roadmap for about the six months or so ahead um, from the software side. Uh, if you want to go there and follow along with us, we'll be talking about that a bit today. That's at spot.light.co. That's our blog spotlight. You'll see it on the most recent post. It looks like this, kind of three columns of colors. Um, and as you read it, I would say um, the blue column on the left, it says coming soon. That's kind of the next one to two releases we're planning. Um, the middle column green in development is going to be the, maybe the one to two releases after that, and the, the yellow or orange color on the right um, planned longer development is what we're supposed to hoping to have wrapped up uh, by the end of June. So we're looking at about six months of planning here. Um, and it's something I think that's worth calling out about this camera because it's different than any other camera I've used, certainly, and that it gets these software updates monthly right now it's been since we started shipping um, and it's going to be about monthly until until about June mm -hmm. um, and, and it, it's really an easy process to update my old cameras I used to have to go kind of futz around on a website find some firmware connect the camera do all this crazy stuff now with like an L16 we can just get a software update like I get an app update on my smartphone which is really great so these new things are coming to the camera all the time and it, it also kind of merits a cautionary point too that as you read about uh, the camera in the wild, that people are talking about the camera, it's important to pay attention to when that person was writing about their experience with the camera. Because right. in, it, it, since November, the camera yeah. has changed so much. And the camera that you, know, you have today will be very different from what we'll have in June with all the software updates that are coming. So it's, a, it's an interesting uh, journey we're on. We're kind of breaking the mold of what it means to, to own a camera and, and update a camera with that. But, it's, but that's, I think, it's really exciting. Yes, right? yes. We've we gotten mm -hmm. a lot of feedback. Um, about the updates being very helpful. And we're also taking this feedback and uh, prioritizing our roadmap based on that. So when you write to us, we say, OK, you know, 10 people, 20 people in the last two weeks have asked for this feature. We should maybe move that higher up on the list. And nobody's asking about this other one, so maybe we move that one down. Um, we'll, we'll get to your questions here in just a second. But before we do, I wanted to offer um, a bit of thanks from us. Um, especially to all of you who are out shooting with the L16. We are incredibly grateful for your support and your patience with us. We know this has been a long journey. Many of you have been on this road with us for years now, placing orders as far back as uh, October in 2015. Um, we, we are grateful for your support, um, for all of the feedback you've given us, for the photos that you're sharing. This is a very small team. We're, we're just over 100 people. Um, in three offices around the world. We've given up, I think, a lot of our own uh, personal lives for the last four years to try to get this product into market. And so it's incredibly heartening to get the feedback from you on a regular basis that says, you know, I'm doing new things with this camera, things that I wasn't able to do before. I don't have to take the bag of gear with me all the time. This has become my everyday carry camera. And that's really, um, it, it keeps us going, right? This is what we're, what we're doing this for. 
after all, our goal was to make a photographer's life easier. And that's, that was the vision. That's what we were working towards. And for the last four years, we've worked incredibly hard to, to get to this point. And we hope we continue to, to make uh, progress. And uh, one day we'll be the only camera you need to carry in your bag. Absolutely right. So if you're just joining us again, uh, we're here at Lights headquarters in Palo Alto, California. I'm Brad, I uh, lead marketing and design here, Prashant who leads engineering and product management, and Rajiv who is our CTO and co-founder. Um, and we're gonna get to your questions now. If you have not yet submitted a question, um, you can try to do so in the chat next to the video. We've got uh, teammates monitoring that and they're gonna ping them to my computer. We can also uh, take submissions on the form that we uh, publicized yesterday. You can get there by going to light.co slash ask. So I'll start with a couple uh, kind of best practices and housekeeping questions we got um, yesterday, and then we'll get into some of the technical questions and a bit of a roadmap. Um, Sean Barnett asked, um, are there any good courses or tutorials available? Um, we've actually just posted for the first time some tutorial video uh, made by our support team. Those are on YouTube now, and we're going to integrate them into our quick start guide. Um, anytime you're stuck with the camera, going to light.co slash start will get you into the user manual, the quick start guide, and get you all sorts of content to help, you know, kind of unstick a situation. And of course, if you get, if you can't find what you're looking for there, you can always email us at hello at light.co. I think um, it's also a good idea to, to just go and read stuff. Because this camera does behave very differently and there's a learning curve to it there is. to take pictures. So it's just a good idea to go in and go through these, some of the articles. It'd be very helpful when you're taking pictures later. That's right. And I'd encourage people to use the feedback app on the device. It's totally. sort, of, sort of a unique engagement between the company and its, and its users that um, really do, does benefit engineering when we get that feedback. That's yeah. right. So there's a feedback app on the camera. It's, it's kind of one layer behind the home screen. If you have an issue with the camera, you pop that up, you can send us a note, you can put your email in there so we can get back in touch with you and it will send us some diagnostic data um, along with that report so we can kind of help to triage what's going on. The other thing it's I'll call it's actually sometimes better than sending LRI files to us because we, we get logs of data that are not contained in the LRA. I'll place. take both. Yes. And, <laughs> take and both. oftentimes the support team will set up a Dropbox for you to send right, right. Um, LRI files to us so we can help to diagnose what might be going on um, with a given image. Um, there's also two really great Facebook groups that we monitor uh, pretty regularly here um, that are great uh, forums for uh, getting help from peers, that people, other people that have the camera, seeing best practices. We've got some people that have created some really cool uh, tools to mm -hmm. use the camera with a viewfinder aid, um, some tripod mounting aids. So it's fun to see that uh, bubbling up in the community. And I think those are great places um, to go on Facebook and kind of have that conversation uh, with those people as well. Um, uh, we also got a question about what apps we recommend for editing. I think the, the default here for most people and I think out there we're seeing is Photoshop or Lightroom. Um, it gives you kind of the, the most power and flexibility when dealing with the big DNG files that are coming out of Lumen, um, but we've also seen some people doing Snapseed and yep. um, other uh, mobile editors on Android, and that, that's been good for them as well. Mm -hmm. um, let's turn to the roadmap now, because um, I know this, I think the hottest question we got was, what's coming next and when is it coming? So <laughs> we've got an update coming, I think, next week, right? Yes, yeah. by, the end of, by the end of January, there'll be another OTA, which um, I, I hope folks are kind of enthusiastically looking forward to. There's a lot of uh, time and energy that went in even over the holidays in preparation for this release. Uh, there's two big features that I think I'd, I'd call out as, as um, something to, to look forward to. We have um, what's called wide dynamic range. It's, it's another way in which we, on behalf of the person taking the shot, um, the, the firmware, the software, uh, intelligently decides to adjust certain parameters about um, essentially the, the, the sensor. And we can uh, derive a picture with when we use uh, what's called WDR or wide dynamic range, we can derive a picture that will improve um, in the highlights between one to one and a half stops, at least with the, our internal testing, that's what we're saying. So that, that will essentially come to you in, in the next release. And then another, I think, major, and it will be very obvious improvement in the camera, is the addition of what we call dynamic autofocus. And so those of you who have the camera today appreciate the fact that when you uh, decide to do focus, you have to tap on the screen or use the, the shutter button. Um, it will take, uh, the camera will then uh, uh, acquire focus and it will stay focused. So it, it, it's essentially focus locked on the, um, the plane of focus that you've selected. What we're adding in, because we know people care for it, are uh, a slew of sensor driven and uh, face detection driven um, dynamic autofocus. So essentially the camera will on your behalf uh, choose a face, will uh, use other sensors to decide when to refocus or focus on a, on a new plane. 
And we think that that that's, um, uh, should be very useful to a number of people. You can toggle it off if you like, so you can go back to the experience you, you currently have. Um, that's easy to do in the UI. Uh, and then over time, this is essentially just the first implementation, in, in the coming weeks and months, you're gonna see significant improvements even to dynamic autofocus. And it's, it's an area that we wanna spend a lot more time on, I think, uh, to make it easier for you to achieve the picture you really want. And it just, starts with fundamentals like focus. Let me just reiterate on one point that Prashant mentioned, because this question keeps coming up, um, and it's about focus lock. So today, the way you have the firmware, when you click to focus on something, the, it, the camera locks the focus at that point in time until you take the shot. Right. So even if the circle disappears, the, the blue circle something, the focus is locked at the last position you focus. So, so it's important for people to know, so you don't have to continuously keep tapping the same object to focus again, the camera locks the focus. And, and there are other tips about focusing on, on, on the site that Brad mentioned. I think it's worthwhile to go and, and, and look at them because this camera does behave differently. It is a, it is a different, different beast. Yeah, and Anne-Marie asked um, if focus lock is on the list for updates to the camera. So that's actually coming right. next week. So, so dynamic autofocus essentially changes the paradigm a little bit. You will be able to explicitly lock focus even in dynamic autofocus mode. So you, you don't have to forego dynamic autofocus if you want to have focus lock. Uh, there'll be more detail coming from um, the marketing team uh, in terms of the tutorials. They'll explain this. Hopefully, it's intuitive. We'll continue to improve the experience in the coming weeks and months. And tell if it's not, if it's not intuitive. Yeah, exactly. We, we exactly. take that feedback yeah. to heart, and we try to rewrite uh, content where it doesn't always make sense. It is a complicated piece of technology. We're doing our best, I think, to explain <laughs> it. But we live in the, in the trenches, so sometimes it's, it's help, helpful to hear your feedback with fresh eyes. Um, Video was another huge question. So when is video coming? And I think the asterisk I want to put on video, uh, anytime we talk about it, is video on the L16 will not be the same as stills are in that when we take a still, we take 10 pictures at once and then computationally combine them. We won't be doing that with video, but there are some benefits because we have these long focal length optics. Do you want to talk about kind of video and the, roughly how we're going to roll that out? Yeah, so we, we've created a, an ASIC, our own chip, that essentially controls multiple modules at the same time. And um, that was no easy task. Largely, the chip was built to do exactly what we do in still computational photography today, which is capture um, multiple images simultaneously, but not only that, control the lens location, mirror locations. There's a lot of actuator control that has to happen. One of the added benefits that we have, though, with, when, with respect to video, is that we can dynamically switch between any of the modules in the camera today. And what that lends itself very um, nicely to a video recording use case. So we can basically zoom from 28 to the 70 mm modules that many of you are familiar in the camera, and we'll switch over to the 70 with no interruption to the actual video recording. So you don't have to stop um, when you select a new focal length that requires a new module. That in and of itself is, um, a, we think, a very cool feature. But you're switching literally from 28 to 70 mm, so you're optical again at 70 as you continue to record, and that happens again at 150. So essentially in your pocket, you have a camera that can record up to 4K at 150 mm, and you can dynamically zoom in between. So we'll be introducing 1080p with uh, electronic image stabilization, and then we'll, we'll get around to providing 4K uh, in, in a software update again. Yeah, so that's exciting. That'll come probably this summer, early this summer, yeah, maybe late this right, spring. That's right. um, but we're, we're definitely, it's on the roadmap, and we've got resources working on it now. Um, we've got a lot of questions about iOS as well, and a few, I think, confused questions about, you know, this, they hear this camera runs Android, and so I'm an Apple person or a Mac person. Does this mean I can't use it? Um, important to call out that it's, it is a device that runs Android, but you can plug it into a Mac uh, just like any other camera, and our desktop app, Lumen, will, will recognize the camera. You can use that. Um, where we get a little bit into trouble is with iOS right now because iOS and Android don't play nicely over Bluetooth. Uh, so iOS doesn't play nicely so with Android. <laughs> <laughs> and this so, is fundamentally not an Android problem. This is an iOS problem. Right. And so we are working on an iOS solution to bring images from the camera to iOS devices, the iPhone, the iPad, etc. Um, and so the question we had from, from Jamie was, will Lumen ever be available on iPad Pro or any tablet? And the good news is we are uh, working on Lumen for iOS now. It will hopefully roll out in Q2. Uh, an initial beta where it simply gets photos from the right. L16, processed JPEGs, brings them over to your iOS device and lets you go onward. From there, long term, that Lumen for iOS, you want to bring in all of the processing, the depth editing, uh, eventually remote camera control. And mm -hmm. um, we'll bring that to an Android app as well at some point so that you can kind of do the time lapse or other things where you would want to have a remote viewfinder on the camera. 
um, on your mobile device. It's also one of my personal goals because this is my my device of choice that That's I all use, Rajiv so carries I, around. I, yeah. I, I want I right. want the processing on this. Day. Rajiv <laughs> only has a laptop because of Lumen, so we're trying, <laughs> we're trying to <laughs> trying to get, get rid of that for him. Um, John asked, are there any plans to add wireless remote control? We just talked about that for a second. Also, capability for L16 to trigger strobes or flashes wirelessly. Do you want to talk about um, strobes and this camera and kind of what we recommend for lighting? So, yeah, the, the way the, the lighting on this camera works maybe is a little different uh, than the way it works on, on SLR cameras, perhaps closer to how it works on, on uh, phones. Because one of the things we have in this camera is a rolling shutter. So, which means that Strobe lighting, the xenon flashes and stuff, are probably not the most appropriate form of lighting to, to take pictures with uh, this camera because of rolling shutter considerations. So uh, what we have is, is LED lighting, which is steady during the, the, the course of, of, of the scan. So in rolling shutter, the pictures really scan from the top to the bottom in about 30 milliseconds. And uh, so you need the light to be on for 30 milliseconds, not for shorter than a millisecond, which will be typically what a, what a strobe flash, like a xenon flash would be. Mm -hmm. so, um, so if we have strong LED lights that can stay on, so we will, have, we will sync those LED lights with the exposure in the camera in the future. We have an accessory port that, that we can use for that purpose mm -hmm. uh, going forward. Um, question also about uh, blur. So we have the synthetic aperture concept. We, do, uh, we apply blur in a, in a post process. Um, we're doing Gaussian right now. Uh, mm -hmm. The question was, what other blurs might we do? When might we do them? Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. So, so, so we do. So, as as everybody knows, we actually do the blur computationally. The the individual pictures we take are very very large depth of field pictures, and the way we introduce blur is is in Lumen, and we do that through processing. Now, currently we're using Gaussian blur, um, but I understand that you know a lot of the current cameras do a disk bouquet and, 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 and some people like other forms of blur, uh, which we can all do because it's done in post computationally. However, we have a small team and we would like to hear from you. If enough people want us to prioritize that feature over others, we're happy to do so. Uh, but otherwise, it is in a list of priority somewhere and we will be introducing various types of blurs, not just Gaussian, not just disk, but maybe over Christmas you can have a star bouquet or something like that. You know, and we, we will be offering these features. It'll just take us some time to get there, unless somebody wants us to prioritize. And if we hear from enough people, we will do that. That's a theme you'll hear again and again today, and, and one we um, take, take to heart internally, is that we, we, we love the feedback, and kind of sensing how many people are looking for something in particular helps us um, to prioritize that. Brad, um, uh, just real quick, yeah. just to jump back. I think earlier you had said about remote control. Mm -hmm. So one of the features in the January release will be the ability, there's more compatibility. I think some folks have found uh, um, like selfie sticks or remote controls that will trigger over Bluetooth to capture remote capture. So the compatibility for that will significantly increase with the January release. And most, most of these things that are known to be compatible, uh, at least with an Android device, will, will now be compatible with ours. We'll, we'll add more controls over Bluetooth over time as well, like the ability to zoom and refocus. Great. Uh, Bill asks, when will you add image stabilization? And we have a couple different ways to think about that with yes. the way this camera is constructed. Do you want to go on that? So image stabilization, one of those things when we were designing the camera, the whole system, we consider very carefully. Uh, now, the way traditional cameras stabilize images, there's something like an optical image stabilization where you move uh, a lens or one element in the lens to stabilize the image based on how the camera is moving in the hands of uh, the, the photographer. Now, um, we, we thought a lot about it. Our choice was an image stabilization would have been to put 16 different stabilizers since we have 16 cameras. And we thought a much better way to do that would be um, to actually stabilize the whole camera, perhaps, per se. So we have, and, and we do, uh, we can also do processing to stabilize the image. So one of the, the problems with, and people have brought this in the context of low light imaging as well. Um, when you take an image and if you don't have stabilization, you have to restrict the exposure time uh, significantly to not introduce blur. And restricting the exposure time means you reduce the light that the camera captures. And, and obviously the quality of picture directly depends on how much light the camera captures. So we're gonna do stabilization in two phases. The first is just electronic stabilization, which means if the correct exposure time required to take an image at a good quality, let's say 100 milliseconds, and you can't take a 100 millisecond exposure because of blur reasons, 
then what we will do is we will break that exposure up into several exposures of much smaller uh, duration so that each image is individually sharp. And then we will basically shift those images depending upon how the camera moved and add them, stack them together and add them so that we have a sharp image uh, which is not blurred but, but captures all the light we, we intended to capture. So that should significantly improve the performance in low light. Uh, we call that image stacking. And we're, doing, we're not doing that We're not doing today, that currently. So. And, 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 and I hold his feet to the fire for that, <laughs> so I'm going to point to him to, to tell you when it's coming. <laughs> so, soon, very soon. So the, other, the second phase of, of doing that, and, and also because we have 150 mm focal length uh, uh, operation in the camera as well, and as you know, people, photographers know that to stabilize the camera is much more important, larger focal lengths. So uh, we, we have plans that we're working on developing yet another kind of grip that will attach to the camera and basically stabilize the whole camera. It would be a very small grip. It's, it's a fairly elegant design that it's a, it's a very small group that, that fits in the camera. It doesn't have huge motors, or, but it'll also provide maybe battery power to the camera, and it will stabilize the camera as a whole. And it'll offer not just one or two degree stabilization for, for taking still pictures, but uh, you know, 30, 40 degree stabilization. So if, if you're taking a video uh, with the camera eventually, that the, the video will also be stabilized with it. So, so that, that's the two phase approach that we have. The first one will just be electronic stabilization. And then we will come up with hardware uh, attachment to the camera that will stabilize the camera as a whole. Uh, question from Andrew on HDR. When is that coming and what does that look like for our particular camera? So, so, we're, so we can do various these features. We can wait until perfection happens and then introduce them. So the way we're doing HDR is, as Prashant mentioned, wide dynamic range. It is just one component of, of the HDR feature. So as soon as we develop something, we want to put it out in the next release. And so the HDR has there's many different parameters you can control at HDR, especially when you have multiple apertures. You can expose different cameras differently. And you can also stack images in time and expose them differently. And we plan to introduce all of these variants of HDR uh, as soon as Shant can be ready with them and deliver them. So we're not doing any of that now, though. We're, we're not. not. And we're so not. the dynamic range we're seeing kind of, it's like the native or organic dynamic range is, is pretty good, but we're going to get some really interesting. So the wide dynamic range, as Prashant mentioned, will add a step and a half to that. And that's just one of the, the steps that we're taking. Right, uh, right. And, and I, I think in order of operations, in case people are, um, are wondering, the team is focused on then providing low light stack as as Rajiv just articulated. And I think then you'll see after that, uh, as we have confidence that there are no exceptions to the rule with respect to WDR, um, wide, wide dynamic range with, with stacked, and then you'll see us introduce spatial HDR, which um, we think will be pretty exciting when it comes out. Uh, Andrew also asked about uh, controlling focus manually. And I, I presume what he meant was, you know, could I ever have a dial where I say, I want to focus at 10 feet or infinity or, or anywhere in between and kind of set a distance as opposed to tap to focus. You want to talk about focus and how it's... So, yeah, maybe I should just generally talk about focus first and before we get into sure. this. Uh, so focus on this camera works slightly differently than photographers on SLR cameras are used to. So, uh, what, so there are, as I mentioned earlier, there are tips on focusing that I recommend you to read, but I'll recap some of the things in there. So typically, when you focus on an object in a SLR camera, if you focus on somebody's face, you actually want to focus on their face because the depth of field is, of the images is fairly narrow because the aperture opening on SLR cameras is, is, is rather large to collect a lot of light. Now, we break those up into many apertures, each of which is small. And so when you focus on somebody's face in our camera, you can focus on their face. But if they're moving around or if you're trying to you know, capture a kid who's running around, it's equally effective for us and perhaps even more to focus on stationary ground right next to the object. Since the stationary ground isn't moving, uh, you have better chance of getting much better focus. And since our individual pictures have very large depth of field, if you focus on the ground next to the object, the focus on, on the object of interest would be just as good and wouldn't have a blur. As I said, this people who are experienced with SLRs may not, this may not come naturally to them, but for our camera, this is, this is a different way of focusing, and, and it works. Now, the question that you had on focusing, manual focusing. So since, again, since individual images are very uh, large depth of field, and the apertures are very, fairly small, um, what, so a lot of people have asked about infinity focusing. So what we recommend for infinity focusing for now, 
we will at some point introduce infinity focusing just as as Brad mentioned, maybe just a distance-based focus. But what we recommend for now is just find an object that is 50 meters or, or more away from the camera. Just focus on that object. Then reframe your shot to focus in, uh, to, to, to capture anything at infinity. So for example, if you're taking the picture of stars, just focus an object 50 meters away, and then point at the stars and, and, and click, and, and they will be in focus. Uh, because, as I said, the individual pictures that we take are very light depth of field. Our hyperfocal distance is, is 50 meters. So if you focus there, everything will be in focus. What I'm saying does not apply to, to SLR cameras. Mm -hmm. This will not work over there, but it will work with the L16. Um, Adam says, are there plans to implement a histogram or other shooting tools to help get more quantitative information about photos in camera? Yes, and uh, we've heard some of this feedback from the community. So this is, this is an example of something that sort of bumped further up on the priority list. It dovetails pretty well with our development roadmap because what we're um, actively working on is, is effectively taking auto exposure, as, as most folks know it in, in the industry, to become multi-aperture aware. And so that, that requires essentially a ground up uh, um, implementation of AE in a way that no one's had to do before. So we're learning some of the challenges inherent to that. That, will, that runs uh, essentially on our ASIC, that custom chip I mentioned before. That then will enable us to have accurate stats for a histogram such that you as an end user can, can see it in, in the UI, you can use it. Um, I know that's a little bit of detail, but that's, that's sort of the, uh, the, um, the dependency that we have before we roll out histogram is, is that multi-aperture uh, AE. The good news is we're actively working on it. It's, it's quite far along, so that, that will be coming out very soon. Great. Let me just make a general comment regarding, uh, you know, people want manual stuff and histograms. So in this camera, since we're taking multiple pictures, there will always be an element of the camera or the chip itself controlling a, a lot of what goes on because it's impractical for, for us to expect a user to control 10 cameras differently, right? So mm -hmm. even though you'll see the histogram, you'll see manual focus, but you have to realize that even when you think it's manual, it's nothing in this camera is, is, is totally manual, right? Because the processing has to be done to, com to basically control 10 different things rather than one thing. And, and, and it's impractical for a user to control all 10 of them. So. And the user, I, I can appreciate that for a histogram, particularly in, in the case of the L16, again, the way the camera behaves, um, just developing the rapport with the camera, seeing some of this information come back to you in a histogram, I, I can appreciate that that's a closed loop that a lot of uh, photographers want with the camera. And, and so that, that's, that's our way of providing it so you can get a better uh, intuitive feel for what the camera would do uh, on your behalf. Adam also asked, is there a vision for an improved end-to-end -end workflow that doesn't include lumen processing? Yes, uh, so that we also have heard loud and clear. <laughs> We're always going to be working on this. Um, you know, I, I know many of you appreciate the fact that this is a fundamentally different uh, way in which the, ca the image is captured than the way in which an image is processed. Um, we've tried to dovetail it with um, existing workflows with respect to giving you the ability to take a DNG out of Lumen uh, and, and go into your favorite editor of choice. Uh, I think what you'll see from light in the coming year, this year, is a full-on device processing. Um, you know, this is a, a powerful Snapdragon processor. It is not your, your laptop. It's, it's not your PC, but it has the capability of doing full-on device processing. We're going to enable that by the end of the year. Um, the other thing that, which then takes uh, several editing tools and steps out of the process. Um, the other thing that we'll, what we're investigating uh, is, is working with Adobe and others to introduce plugins directly into their applications. And I think that will streamline again quite a bit. Um, there's nothing inherently that requires Lumen. Uh, it's just a way for us to be able to give a tool to people who don't necessarily have Photoshop, who don't have Lightroom. And I think that's important um, to be able to uh, allow a, a wide group of, of folks to, to be able to actually use the camera and have the full capability. But we appreciate that some people want to go directly into Lightroom, directly into Photoshop. And I think that's something we're actively investigating. And we will evolve Lumen to, to yes, add some exactly. features for people who exactly. don't have Photoshop or don't want to use Photoshop, they can use it. But we will also respect people's ability to use what right. I mean, Adobe's had decades <laughs> to make their application. I, and I think it, it works very, very well for a lot of folks out there. Um, and, and so we'll, we'll investigate doing a plugin um, for those products. And I think what you'll just see is, as Rajiv said, a continuous a set of improvements to Lumen itself. And eventually, our hope, just like yours, I imagine, is to do as much as possible on the device itself. 
I, I, as you were talking about that, I saw a bunch of hearts fly by on the Facebook. Oh, yeah? Right. So I think people are excited about that. Um, if you're just joining us, uh, we are here live at Lights Palo Alto headquarters. Uh, I'm Brad. I lead the marketing and design teams here. Prashant leads the engineering and product management teams. And Rajiv is our CTO and co-founder. And we're taking your questions and, and really thrilled to have so many people engage with us. We got hundreds of questions on the form. If you're still interested in asking, you can ask in the chat. And uh, you can also submit on our form at light.co slash ask. A uh, question from Anil. Are you working with Nokia on their new five camera device? Uh, it is our policy not to comment on rumors and speculation, so we'll leave that one there and move on to the next one from Daniel, who says, will the L16 eventually have a pano photo capability similar to what smartphones offer? Yeah, eventually it will. And again, it's just a matter of prioritization. We have a relatively undistorted picture, so it's actually easy for, uh, for uh, us to stitch them together in pano mode. Um, but again, it's one of those things, you know, we have, a small team with limited resources. We would like to listen to, uh, to be, if more people ask for it, then we can prioritize it. Uh, Andre, so we're moving on to grip and accessories at the moment. Uh, we got a bunch of grip that we had talked about back when we took pre-orders. Um, Rajiv talked about another concept for a stabilizing grip um, that we're also in development on. Um, we are working on the grip that we talked about in 2015. It's still in development. We've kind of prioritized getting the camera up and stable <laughs> and, and everybody um, happy with the software. So that's been the focus of the company for, for the last year. Um, and so we're now looking at bringing these accessories to market, hoping to do that um, in the middle part of this year. But we'll have an update on that hopefully in the next few months. Um, a lot of questions about image quality overall. Um, we had Arun ask, has DxO tested your device? And if so, what are the results? Do you want to talk about uh, how we've kind of... Yeah, so early on, we actually... Uh, DxO has two, two... There's sort of two things to DxO. So DxO has um, lab and infrastructure equipment that they sell to anyone who wants to write a check for it. Um, don't think anyone has this in their home, but we, we have a full setup uh, here in, in Palo Alto at our, at our headquarters. And um, it, it's a great lab environment. It, it really gives um, consistent objective results. So we're frequently, essentially on a daily basis, we're in that lab. We're testing the builds, the software builds that we have, um, algorithm improvements that we have. And so it's, it's, it's a great way to get objective data. Um, you know, much of what uh, folks will see posted on forums and the like are, are subjective images shot, um, you know, when they're out, outside. It, this is a very controlled environment, and it's, and it's a great way to measure the, the camera performance. It is, it's not a subjective evaluation. It's very much an objective one. So that's one, one aspect of DxO. The other thing that DxO does, and there's, there's other vendors actually who, who do the same thing, they have a mark. So they have a score that they give uh, products in, in, in sort of various areas. So the one that probably close, close, most closely matches the L16 would be the DxO mark for sensor. Uh, the, the challenge for DxO and for everybody in the industry, frankly speaking, is that computational imaging, computational photography specifically, um, it, it just sort of changes how those tests should be done and, and, how, and how they actually effectively measure the performance of a camera. And so we're, we're working with the industry uh, to actually change those or update those benchmarks in a way that accurately reflects the performance of, um, of products like the L16. So the mark scores uh, aren't really relevant today. Uh, they will be, I, I'm sure, in, in the near future. Um, suffice it to say, we're still using the equipment. We do tests internally to make sure that we're uh, achieving the best results possible. Uh, next question for Rajiv, uh, another technical one from Michael Gmerkin, uh, who's been with us since, I think, the beginning online and, and often answers questions on our behalf <laughs> online. We, we love Michael. Um, how is work coming on depth map and compositing issues related to busy or confused areas like interleaved grass or tree branches? So what you have in the camera today was our first generation depth mapping algorithm. We already have in the lab a much improved depth mapping algorithm. We just have to, it has to work its way into, into uh, the pipeline for, for release and testing. So well, we're working on it and we, have, we can produce much better depth results and a lot of the issues that you see in, in uh, stitching the images can, uh, and especially around depth boundaries are due to the fact that uh, the current first generation depth map algorithms are not as good as, as, as the current ones which, with which we, you should not see many of these issues. Now, I'm not pro uh, promising perfection uh, with the next release, but the way I look at it is just 
you know, it's an evolutionary process. The next release will make it significantly better. And, and every release after that will, will make it better and better. So um, it's for, and it's not, the timeline for this is not that, uh, you know, there will be a release which will fix everything. It's an incremental process. And you'll see that when we, we, we introduce our next generation depth map algorithm, that all of these things will, will get substantially better. It goes back to an earlier point that this camera changes almost every yes. month. And so as right. you kind of read things out in the market, it's always whatever that snapshot in time was the reality of the time, and it's hard to judge. So I think as you're looking at for people to talk about the camera, if you're on the fence about getting the camera, um, helpful to hear from people who have it right now and are on the current software, because it does meaningfully change from month to month as we push these updates out. I saw another question fly by. When is the update coming? We talked about this at the top of the Q&A. Um, next update is supposed to be next week. It's in final QA right now. So if all things check out, should be um, in your on your cameras uh, sometime next week. But uh, obviously, we got to get everything. Prashant's two team is doing a lot of testing. That's right. We, we wanna, it's a lot of work to produce an update because we have to test every aspect of it. It's not just doing the work and, right. and writing yeah. the code. I think that's just to peel the curtains back to, to get a sense of how a company like Light gets software out to the world. Uh, it's not just software, right? I mean, in a sense, what we're, what we're trying to impress upon everybody is this is a software-defined camera, but that doesn't mean that it's just simply a software engineer's responsibility to make a, a software release. This isn't just a matter of making bug fixes, per se. This is a very cross-functional team within Light. We have computational imaging scientists working alongside software engineers who are working um, top to bottom, uh, from the application layer down to the firmware that's actually executing many of the basic operations vis-a-vis uh, -vis like sensors and actuators and the like. And then we have an image quality team that is constantly assessing the, the, the promises that we're making in terms of the algorithm or the, the system execution. And I think it's a very complicated, almost a very complicated narrative within the company because we're, we're, we're constantly having a very healthy debate internally. And we, we, on the basis of where we think we are, we hold ourselves to promise you a very high standard um, that if it's good enough, then we want to release it. But I think to, to Rajiv's point, this is such a new technology and, and system that it, it benefits us greatly to get the constructive feedback from the community um, rather than hold on and wait for perfection. Because otherwise, um, you know, it might take us a very long time to achieve that milestone. So I think we're holding ourselves to a high bar. We're trying to release things that we think are, are mature enough that the community would appreciate having them. Dynamic autofocus is another example of that. And, and I think if it doesn't quite work right, please give us that feedback because this is a very useful way for us to say, well, there's a corner case or an edge case that we maybe didn't see ourselves that we can evaluate and we can then fix. And I, and I hope the community has at least seen some of that um, for the last several months, right, since July of, of last year. Uh, question from John. Is there any possibility of using computational techniques to correct rolling shutter um, and also the banding caused by LED or fluorescent lighting. I think we saw last week someone post a picture of a drummer who was in the action and the drumstick kind of bent a little bit. Is that something we can solve computationally? Um, eventually. Um, but there's a way to deal with rolling shutter artifacts that, that can minimize the artifacts. Um, so there, there are various solutions to it. Uh, for the very long term, you know, uh, things need to change in the sensor, and that will probably happen at some point in time. But in the meantime, and we will also work on computational algorithms, but I can't promise that we can fix all com uh, or rolling shutter art artifacts simply by uh, computational algorithms. Uh, we can minimize a lot of that. Sometimes you can minimize the effect just by the way you hold the camera, uh, whether you hold it in landscape mode or portrait mode, depending on how you're moving. Um, but we will be working to minimize these things, and over the long term, just as a technology roadmap, not a product roadmap, there are other ways to, to deal with ro uh, rolling shutter artifacts that we, we'll be working on uh, together with our maybe sensor partners and stuff like that. So on the banding front, very quickly, um, LED lights are particularly challenging. There's uh, many frequencies at which they emit, unlike uh, some other lighting like fluorescence, which are, are, are more um, consistent maybe worldwide. Uh, there's a few still, but they're, they're more consistent. So that, that's always a challenging um, lighting condition. It would be challenging for almost any camera. Uh, we're, uh, with that multi-aperture um, uh, auto exposure that I mentioned before that we're, we're working towards, that's actually one of the things that we, we plan to be implementing as part of um, uh, that new AE that would allow us to mitigate the effects of, um, of LED lighting across a range of frequencies. 
Sometimes the effect can, even if we mitigate them, can still show up in manual settings. Right. Because you pick your right. own exactly. uh, time of exposure, and, and if that doesn't, so you, we need the time of exposure to be um, uh, sort of a multiple of twice the, uh, the line frequency, if you will. So in, in this country, it's one over 1 20th of a second. Uh, and in manual settings, you can pick whatever you want, and sometimes that effect will show up, and sometimes it surprises the, uh, uh, the photographers, uh, especially the ones that deal with uh, cell phones more because they haven't seen it because cell phone doesn't pick that time. There's no manual mode in it. But people uh, with SLR cameras are perhaps more used to it. Mm -hmm. Linda asked about um, aperture. So she said, how do you know whether the aperture is operating, if the camera is operating at max aperture, um, and what is the max aperture of the L16? And this is kind of one of the, the big narrative pillars of getting into computational imaging and using these mobile modules, is that aperture, as we knew it before, is now totally different. So we, we have many cameras, and each of it is, is always, the aperture is always fully open. We don't stop them down. Uh, to get a little more technical, our lenses are diffraction limited. So if we try to stop the lens and, and narrow the aperture, we will introduce blur uh, in the picture. We'll reduce sharpness in the picture. So we never do that. However, our individual lenses are small enough that they take very large depth of field pictures. So a lot of what aperture is, is used for in, in creative photography is to control the depth of field. And we do that through a synthetic aperture operation during processing of the pictures rather than the time we take the pictures. So, uh, so synthetic aperture for us is separate than the actual aperture of the lenses. Our lenses, for all, for, for comparison with SLR cameras, full frame cameras behave like F15 uh, lenses. So all exposures are roughly equivalent to F15 exposures uh, that we take. And we can simulate F2, F4 after the fact. And, and so there's a good reason. We can collect a lot of light by putting many of these, but we don't stop any of them because we don't want to lose sharpness. Uh, Rakesh asked, is it possible to export the generated depth map from Lumen either as a separate grayscale image or as a channel in a file format like OpenEXR? Mm -hmm. So we've been asked uh, for this from, from a number of folks. Uh, we're, we're actively investigating it. Uh, it's probably not something you're going to see in the immediate term. Um, there's a lot of other priorities, uh, as, as you've heard so far, uh, but it is something we're looking at. Uh, this from James, why is the resolution of the image affected at higher focal lengths if the lenses change and not optical zoom? So I think what we're getting at here is the variable resolution uh, paradigm. So I can also first point you to an article on variable resolution that we have on the website that Brad, Brad mentioned earlier, but I can also try to explain it a little bit. So on the camera, we don't have every focal length available. Uh, we have uh, 16 different camera modules. Uh, five of them at 28 mm, five of them at 70 mm, and six of them at 150 mm. So we have discrete focal lengths available. And the way we, we, we take images is uh, at, at any given focal length, you have 10 cameras, uh, up, uh, at least 10 cameras firing. Uh, and at least this span at least two different focal lengths. And so the shorter focal length cameras try to take the entire field of view. And if your field of view is smaller than their focal length, then we crop. And, but the larger focal length cameras tile, uh, uh, we, we, we arrange them so they tile the field of view that you eventually want. So if you want to take a 100 mm picture, so we'll use 70 mm lenses and 150 mm lenses, and the 70 mm lenses will be cropped to 100 mm field of view. Well, the 150 mm lenses will try to tile the 100 mm field of view, but the way they, they will do it was a significant overlap between them. So we collect all the light from them, but since there's overlap, we're not collecting independent pixels, so the resolution will fall. So as you go from 70 to 150, the resolution goes from 52 megapixel to, uh, to, to 13 megapixel. And that's just uh, how the camera constructs the image, essentially. And as Rajiv said, there's an article on the website that explains right. this in great detail with charts and <laughs> images. Um, highly suggest If you have the patience, yeah. please go ahead and read <laughs> um, Tom, who works in television, asked about video. Um, and and the, the theme is it just feels like it's going to be a crazy amount of processing to try to do computational video. Is this even possible? It, it certainly is possible. The way I look at this, this whole camera is just the first step in a maybe 20 year evolution. And, uh, Computation is, is a challenge, but it's also an opportunity. 
Um, we do intend to do a next gen ASIC at some point in time, which basically takes all of our um, algorithms today uh, that we implement in software and maps them directly into hardware. So we want to hardware accelerate those algorithms so we can basically do all of that processing at, at a small fraction of the power and uh, a, a, a you know, two orders of magnitude higher speed, if you will. So this will allow us eventually do video real time, uh, exactly the same way as we take still pictures right now. On, on that thread, Stacy asked about, um, will we be able to record audio? And we do have an audio interface, so we should be able yes, to yes. capture uh, that. Well, two forms. So we have mic inputs, um, uh, actual microphones built in, both in the front and back of the camera, and then through the, um, the, the, the uh, audio connector on the bottom, uh, three and a half mm jack. Uh, Heath asks uh, a little bit about the environmental spec. I'm an outdoor enthusiast who likes to take his camera on the river and into the weather. Is this camera waterproof? What about dust and temperature constraints, shock absorption, et cetera? So uh, the camera was designed to be IP52 compliant. And so if we break down um, that, that definition, that industry definition, that means the, the five is meant for dust. And we limit the amount of dust. In the worst case scenario, dust should not really be affecting the camera, but the, we, we limit the, the amount of dust that can come in. Um, it's, but it's not entirely prevented. And I think that, that's one thing I want to quickly highlight. This is not, the camera itself is not weather sealed. Um, there's something that precludes us from being able to do that in, in, in the future somehow, but uh, that wasn't the design intent. We, we wanted to give you the flexibility of not necessarily worrying if, it, if um, that you happen to, to be around some dust in an urban area. And then in terms of the water, it's um, rated uh, a two, which basically means um, you know, rain falling vertically if the device is at an angle. I mean, this is the way in which they test it. But practically speaking, you know, if you get caught um, in, a, in a light shower, uh, it'll be fine. If you drop, well, Duncan, in, if you drop it in, in the river while you're, you're, I mean, definitely sacrifice the camera instead of yourself. But, the, you know, the, the camera is probably not going to come back out and, um, you know, have the same reliability, durability that it was intended to have. Also, just since the camera, the form factor, there's no protrusions, the right. lens doesn't pop out when you change focus you know, or zoom. It should be easier for us and we're eventually working, working yeah. uh, to basically put it in a, in a case that is waterproof uh, for underwater photography. One of the challenges that we have to, to see how to, to, to solve is how do you control the camera because the touch interface may not work. In, so in, that in goes the to the remote but, control yeah. that we're, we're, we're yeah. building foundationally now. And I think it, it, there's some folks who have asked this before about why isn't there an SD card slot, et cetera, right? This is actually one of the reasons mm -hmm. so for a small engineering team to build everything from the modules to the ASIC to the, to the device itself, the, the whole mechanical stack up. Uh, it's challenging to have an ingress point for water or again, dust. Uh, and that's something that we decided um, a while back that we wanted that IP52 to, to be able to give you guys confidence that you can take the, the camera into, in, in most situations. Uh, I've seen a couple of questions fly by about the, the little controls that are above your thumb rest on the right hand that is intended uh, to be a touch strip control. It's, it's turned out to be a rather persnickety component for us. Uh, <laughs> and we're hoping it's on the third column of the roadmap um, that by June we'll enable that. And it'll probably have a couple different uh, functionalities that we'll, we'll let the user decide what they want that to do. Right, right. Um, I'm going to take through a few business questions here. And if we've got a few more technical ones that come in from the team, um, shoot those over to me. Uh, a question from Europe. When will the light L16 be available in Europe? So we have taken uh, pre-orders in the UK since November. Uh, we're hoping to start shipping those by Q2. Uh, we're literally in the process of etching uh, CE marks onto <laughs> chassis in Asia right now. Uh, we have to have all the markings to be in compliance with the regulators in Europe in order to ship into uh, Europe, so that's in process right now. If we're lucky, we might get some units into market by the end of March. Uh, that is our internal goal, but uh, as with everything, when you're trying to move things around the world in this complicated supply chain, uh, you know, it may slip to April or May. Um, as we get better line of sight on that delivery date, we will also open up for the rest of the EU. So right now, we're only taking orders in the UK. The intent is then to roll out internationally kind of on a monthly or bi-monthly basis after that to the various markets. The ones we were in before where we were taking reservations and we had to refund uh, because we didn't have line of sight on delivery, we'll go back to those markets, go back to those original re reservation holders with the price that we had originally offered um, and bring those folks back in. We know that's been a frustrating process. We hear you loud and clear. Um, we're going to make good on it. We are working as fast as we can. Small team. 
international compliance is a hard thing, it turns out. Uh, we did not know what we were chewing uh, when, we, when we took that on uh, originally. Um, is the, how big is the wait list? There is no wait list in the US. If you order a camera today, it will ship today, or if you order it by noon today, it will ship uh, today. And you can you actually now, that's right. <laughs> you can now upgrade to uh, next day air. So if you're in a rush, you need a camera tomorrow, you can actually get a camera tomorrow in the United States. Um, Landon, where can I go to try out the light camera hands-on? Uh, we are now in stores in the U.S. called Beta, B-8-T-A. The number is the name of the B, the letter, letter B, number 8, T-A, dot com is their website. They have about eight or nine stores around the country, um, usually in big cities where they showcase uh, emerging technologies. You can go have a hands-on time with the camera there. Uh, Gene asked about the return policy. Uh, we're still at 90 days for people that are buying right now, so you have plenty of time to take the camera, evaluate it. It's not for you. Send it back to us in original condition, original packaging. Um, no risk there. Just don't drop it in the water. Uh, if you, <laughs> Bill asks, are you offering a payment plan for the camera? We will be rolling out financing for the camera on the website. Um, that will likely hit the end of this quarter or the beginning of the second quarter. Um, John, why does the L16 cost so much? Um, so I'll, I guess, disagree with the premise of so much um, and just say I think we're delivering a lot of value uh, in a very small package. The things that we know people are replacing um, with the L16 are quite a bit more expensive than the price of the camera. Um, and, and this is really the era of the software-defined camera that we're coming into. So I think there's a lot of potential for the technology. We're building this platform at, at the higher end of the kind of mid-range camera segment. I think that that's where we landed um, and, and feel pretty good about that. I think if, if price is a, a concern, uh, we will uh, later this week begin offering refurbished cameras for sale. Um, those have come back from media reviewers and other technical partners that were evaluated in the camera as well as a few photographers. Um, so we'll offer a deal on those. Those have been totally recalibrated, recertified, um, retested, repackaged. They look um, almost like new. Thing. Yeah, so we'll, we'll have that. If you are interested in that, uh, make sure you're on our email list because we'll um, launch that on the email list uh, middle of the week this week. Uh, Simon asked, first, is Light making the L16 Mark II with updated sensors? Second, if there is a next generation camera, what would the upgrade path be? Uh, we're laser focused on the L16 that's in market right now, and we have monthly software updates for the next six months planned that is consuming all of our resources internally, and so that is where our focus is. Um, Cal asks, is the long-term plan to continue with hardware development or to license the software to third parties? Yes, is the answer, yes. Um, we do all of those things. Um, Brian Olson, the 360 crime scene setup is great, but the L16 would make it phenomenal. Will the L16 see use in security type scenarios? This is one of those things where we hear often about the resolution of the camera and the mm -hmm. detail you're able to peep yeah, into yeah. and perceive being um, really interesting for various uh, fields of, of, of uh, professionals. That's right. And then we, we have it on a roadmap to license technology in, in various different verticals. Yeah, there's been considerable, considerable interest. Yeah. One in which there's been a lot of interest, yes. Tyrone asks, I'm just a point and shoot and post guy. Is the L16 camera for me? My priority is 100% clarity and ease of posting. <laughs> that is a hard question for me to answer, right? Because yeah. I think it's very personal uh, as to what um, your tolerance. What, there, are, there are folks at friends, family, um, users that we're aware of, uh, all of us that, that have taken to the L16 because it gives you the ability to zoom from 28 to 150 uh, with remarkably um, high resolution, um, great image quality. And it's something you can just throw in your bag. And that's a convenience that you know, few cameras can really offer. There, there, there are some um, very high-end um, point-and-shoot cameras that do, but I, I sus suspect most of those are not getting updates every month with new features. And, and they don't have the zoom range. And right. So the, somewhere. in a lot of ways, it's a personal decision. I think that that, that would be hard for me to to advocate one way or the other, but I, that's my goal, is to be, I think all of our goals. No, but, but, right. but the other part of it is that we will enable uh, posting in, in the, the camera. Sure, sure. It may not be the highest picture you can get out of that camera, but it'd be good enough certainly to post on most social media sites. Well, and eventually, as we've said, we're, we're gonna be providing full on device processing. There's nothing that precludes that other than just again, prioritization. When we release that, we wanna make sure that um, you know it, it's, as power efficient as it essentially can be on the device, um, because that, that's a that's a 
realistic concern um, all of us have when yeah. this finally lands it's in the hands of end users is the appreciation that that's a lot of um, computation that's happening and, and it will perhaps uh, uh, come at the, the expense of some um, battery life in terms of taking uh, additional pictures. So th those kinds of features will come in due course, which makes me very confident that the point and shoot segment, the ones that don't want to go beyond what the, their, the camera, um, the camera phone experience, the smartphone experience mm -hmm. offers today, th this is this is going to be a great solution for them. Whether it is today or not, I think that that's, that's going to be an individual's decision. That's right. And I think that's the narrative of the updates that are coming over the next six months really are. We're, we're, we're building for power users right now, people that are familiar with photographic principles and want to dig in and really kind of be, we've, we've used this language a lot in talking to people, so is be on this journey with us because we're learning as we go as well and we're taking this feedback to heart and trying to bake it into the product. By the time we get to the summer, you know, and these, yeah. these, this kind of cycle has run its course, I think you're going to see the camera be a much more approachable to yeah. the novice uh, product that will, will kind of invite people to uh, a new level of photography that they might not have been doing before. I think there was a hidden question in there too that said, when can we post from the camera? Probably the way I read it. So. Right, so what Rajiv had just, uh, he had mentioned it um, in passing, but we, we will enable uh, posting directly from um, the on-device gallery uh, to um, certain social networking sites. I don't know if we're disclosing which ones just yet, <laughs> <Not> but yet. <laughs> um, it, it's an active development. So. Those, that, that capability will be there. You won't have to add a second application somehow to the device alike. So it will be built into to the device experience and you'll be able to post directly. And, 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 that, and that's another great uh, part of what we facilitate is people sharing experiences with one another. So we, we understand the importance of, of wanting to do that again without a PC. And this will, this will be a way for enabling it. As Rajiv said, maybe the initial implementation will have just the current on-device processing before we share. That's oftentimes adequate for um, sharing on social networking sites, but we will eventually allow that to happen with even the full-on device processing and editing. I have one more question that's going to excite Prashant, but I'm, I'm disappointed that nobody asked about the bear and the plant behind me. <laughs> like, not one person. There's one person I can think of who would ask that question. <laughs> didn't, didn't hear from him. Um, Chris asks, any love for Linux users? Yeah. Yeah, I have a lot of love for Linux users. So... Uh, and this is not something I, I, I would expect um, the world to appreciate other than the, the sorry, I, Chris. The, Chris Chris would appreciate this. Uh, so we, we ground up, rewrote Lumen um, in a, a remarkably short time. Um, so the first version of Lumen that the world saw, we, we actually completely rewrote that. And we rewrote it in a um, cross-platform framework called Qt. And um, again, those who have a software background, you probably know about Qt, it, it enables um, honestly, companies like us to be able to, to build a, a high quality experience that has consistency across multiple operating systems and, and do it essentially from one code base, right? So again, this all gets back to the practical realities of delivering innovation to the market. We wanted to hit as many operating systems as we could and we realized Qt was the best way to do that, hence rewriting all of it. The long answer to basically say Qt is going to enable us to target Linux distributions and um, probably out of the box will be Ubuntu because we use Ubuntu quite a bit inside the company. So we'll probably hit Ubuntu first. Um, uh, that, that's cat, that cat's out of the bag. But uh, we, the Qt gives us that flexibility. So we can hit other operating system targets very easily. And I think you're going to see that pretty soon, Chris. A lot of work going on here. It's a small team. We love the feedback you were giving us. And keep, please keep it coming. If you have a camera and you're having issues, email us hello at light.co. Use the feedback app on the camera. Directly on the camera, you can send us all sorts of diagnostic information. That's super helpful as we put bug fixes into future software releases. Um, we're unfortunately running out of time here, so, so we're going to wrap up. But uh, really appreciate you're spending time with us and also telling us that this is something you wanted. I think this is a kind of a, a evidence of our, we, we want to hear from you and we want to uh, help, help this process along. Um, so uh, hopefully this was useful. Uh, we'll try to do it again. If it was, let us know that um, and, and what else you'd like to hear in, in future Q and A's and in other channels. Um, and please keep sharing your pictures. We, so, we, just, yeah. so I want to thank everybody for who uses the camera for the feedback. And, and I want to assure everybody that we're working very hard to make their life easier. If you're a photographer, we're working very hard to make your life easier. I know the camera isn't perfect yet, but we will get it there. So just bear with us. Patience is key. Uh, so on behalf of all of us then at Light, uh, thanks for spending time with us today, and we'll, we'll hopefully see you here next time.